You made it great. Thank you so much for being here. Thank all of you for being here. It's wonderful <coughs> to uh, spend this time with you tonight. So, um, I think the theme of my life has been about stepping forward. And I will tell you that for a long time, that's what I have done. Um, I stepped forward to run for the Narvik Borough Council because I was sick and tired of hearing that Republicans thought the town was the way it was because of generations of Republican leadership. And I thought, well, what about my family? We grew up here. <coughs> I've been a lifelong resident. My parents have stepped up. And so I stepped up. I ran for Borough Council. I won my race. And uh, I was the only Democrat for eight years, but I ended up as the president and all Democrats on the board. So I stepped up. I stepped up when um, the seat uh, for the State House became available. My predecessor left. There was an opportunity to run. It was just such a great opportunity. I stepped up and I ran because I believe so strongly that we need more women in elective office. And it was, it, the 148th district that I served in actually had a history of women serving. Uh, Mike Gerber was the little aberration in there, but I stepped up and uh, won that race and have been contributing to the House for the last uh, five years. And now, I have to tell you, a month ago, on February 19th, when I saw the maps for the first time, it was just an incredible moment. And I had been gerrymandered out of the Montgomery County District for almost 30 years. And so despite the fact that people had said to me, you should run for office, you were going to run for Congress, I would say, how can I run for Congress? There's no district that I'm in a majority. I, currently, I'm in a Philadelphia district, which would be ridiculous for me to try to run in. So when I saw the maps and I saw that my town had the line drawn in the right place, so that we were part of a Montgomery County district, I said to my husband, well, I've been complaining all these years that nobody from Laura Marina or Narberth could ever run for Congress. And he looked at me and he said, and all you're ever doing is talking about women. When are you going to run? He said, what are you going to do? And I said, I think I'm going to run for Congress. So that's what got me here. But I will tell you that my local roots, my union upraising as a kid, my non-traditional walk through higher education have all prepared me to run for Congress, to take the chances, to speak up, to be the person who will represent you. It's really exciting, and I am so thrilled to have the opportunity to run for Congress because, believe me, I cried too. I cried too on November 9th. And then I went back to sleep, and I woke up, <laughs> and I thought, Mary Jo, you just got elected, re-elected to your uh, state house seat. You have work to do. Go do it. And one of the, the second thought was, I'm still in the minority because we hadn't won enough seats. So my second thought was, we need to get more women elected. And so I have been working, a lot of you have heard me talk about an organization called Emerge Pennsylvania that I brought into this state. <coughs> the job of Emerge is to empower women to run for office. And that's what I have been working on in addition to legislative work, which you'll hear about in a few minutes. <coughs> but it is so important to me that we have women who are elected, who will be able to run for office, that that is what I spend all my excess energy on at this point. And we have a lot of them running this year. You probably met them. Katie Muth, Liz Hanbidge, uh, Maria Collette, and a number of others. And we are giving them the tools to run. And this seat, this seat in Montgomery County that ties together Western Montgomery County and Eastern Montgomery County, this is our opportunity to bring us together. But you know what? We have another responsibility to send a woman to Congress. I have been working on this. This is something that I take so seriously. It is a really big part of the reason. I got into the race the day after those maps were announced because 
That was my reason. I wanted to be the woman running for Congress. Thank you. slides for you. Okay. There we go. Thank you. All right. All right. Top three legislative priorities for Mary Jo Daly. Six so, minutes. So part of the reason I was so excited about this redistricting and this new map was because I have been working um, on voting rights. And I have spent a lot of time on this whole redistricting issue. I've worked with fair districts. I've had them come into my district for a town hall. I have spoken to groups that they've invited me to come and speak to. I was the prime co-sponsor of the redistricting bill that was in, uh, in the House of Representatives uh, last session, and I'm a co-sponsor of it this session. So, to, so these are things that are just incredibly important to me because I was a committee person long before I ran for office. And the idea that people, you know, like Election Day, my, my husband always tells me Election Day is like Mary Jo's, Fourth of July, Christmas, <laughs> New Year's Eve. And it is because it's when people come out, you meet your neighbors, you're voting for who is going to represent us. And it's so incredibly important. And so when I look at the, I, I consider under voting rights, I actually had a bill on online voter registration which never got passed through the House, but fortunately the governor's people had a way to get that moving. But the redistricting, I think, is just, I have to tell you, if you haven't read the uh, court opinion on this, go get it and read it, because you will laugh out loud. <laughs> because they're using the language that legislators don't get to decide who is in their districts. That's the voter's responsibility. And this is a huge victory for all of us. Um, another priority that I have had, you know, I'm on the Appropriations and the Finance Committee. I also served on Borough Council for 20 years, so I understand about taxes. Taxes and financing our government are incredibly important to me, and this tax giveaway of Trump's is just mind-boggling because it's a tax giveaway to the corporations and it's going to hurt the middle class. It's going to hurt the people with lower incomes. It's not coming yet. It, you know, the, uh, the companies that are boasting about, oh, well, we're giving people a thousand dollar bonus. It's like, great, a thousand dollars a month or a thousand dollars a year. Because if you take a thousand dollars a year, you divide it by 12, you have less than, you know, a hundred dollars and then you're still going to have to pay taxes on it. So it's like, this is not a good thing for us, and we really need common sense managing of our fiscal house. I did that when I was on the Norbert Borough Council, and I do it in the House of Representatives today. My last priority I want to tell you about is an opportunity I had to work on the Medical Marijuana Working Group. I was asked by our leadership if I had an interest in joining this group back in the summer of 2015, and I didn't have a sharply defined opinion of the topic, and so I thought this would be a good learning experience. And I have to tell you, the reason I'm making it as a legislative priority is because the way we worked, it was a bipartisan group of representatives who sat around the table and talked and listened to each other. You talked about your priorities and how you want things to go when you're working together. This was actually a group of representatives who listened to each other and we talked and we worked out a bill that would be able to pass in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. I'm really proud of that work because I think that it's the way I would like to see things happen. That's a pipe dream in some ways because what we really need now is we need more Democrats at the table so that we could actually begin to have full-blown discussions because without that we're not going to be able to do it. We're just not going to be able to do it because the numbers are so skewed and the numbers are skewed in Washington also. This is a huge opportunity for us here in Montgomery County to quite honestly send a woman to Congress. <laughs> and uh, that's basically what I have to say about that. And you haven't held up the time yet, so I can go on to a summary. Okay. Is that good? Yeah. Is that good with everybody? Yeah. If you want to clap for the priorities. <laughs> I 
imagine that they're not like enjoying the clapping. I don't know. I, mean, I would love it when people clap for me. Please. I love the clapping. Are you kidding? So thank you for taking yeah. time for All clapping. Right. Thank you for clapping. Summary. <laughs> Summary. I am ready to go to Washington. I bring a solid middle class union background. I think that makes me different. I have lived through situations that I can respond to what people in Montgomery County are looking for. I have experienced a lot of it. So in addition to my education and my legislative experience, I also bring the experience of how I grew up and the values that I was raised with. And as a woman, we all know that if you don't have a seat at the table, you are on the menu. So I bring that because I know that we are not getting a fair shake in Washington right now. It is incredibly important that we are able to stand there shoulder to shoulder with other representatives. I would like to be that person. So thank you so much for everything you are doing. So I was a Girl Scout for a long time. And the thing that I remember most about Girl Scouts was that you always left a place better than you found it. And I think that that simple statement that I learned as a little girl is the way that I think about the environment because we are really making a wreck of it because of not acknowledging things like climate change and not acknowledging um, what we put into our air, the methane and, and other, that these are real issues. And we need science. I, I worked with scientists when I worked at the University of Pennsylvania and really got a hugely wonderful appreciation of how scientists work. And um, I understand what happens when they're not funded. It, it's kind of like everything sinks. And so I think that that's incredibly important that we uh, continue to fund science and uh, the EPA, the DEP, and all of the other environmental groups. We also, I think, have to take a different look at regulations because, you know, we call them regulations, but in a lot of ways, they're really protections for people. And we hear people, you know, like there's this huge thing about getting rid of regulations down in uh, Washington, the federal government, but there's also, we see it in the state. But I think we have to change the way we look at regulations and understand that, you know, maybe they're onerous at times, but maybe there is a really good reason that they're onerous because um, because bad things happen, and that is not, that's, that's a problem for us. But the, the other thing I think on alternative energies, I mean, I think this last uh, set of storms that we had with so many power outages out across the area, I think we actually really have to start looking, and maybe people are looking and I'm just not aware, but <coughs> we, alternative ways of storing energy so that we are, you know, I don't know if it's even possible, but there, if you think about electric cars, and electric cars are now going to be um, using electricity from our grid, what happens? I mean, and you look at, you know, the development of batteries that can actually make these cars go further. I think that we need to start to look at the future, because I think what Donald Trump has done as our president, he's just put so much crap out there yeah. that yeah. he's... We're losing the point of what's happening with our future. Yeah. And I think that it's really important that we focus on the future and start to really recognize some of the things that are happening and what are we gonna do about them. So I think that alternative energies are incredibly important, that we have to really be exploring them. I think different ways of storing uh, energy are really going to be important. And so I think that we really need to open our minds and start looking at the future which then goes to education and environment and everything else. Okay. So thanks. All right. So public education, how can we make sure it's funded? I miss Betsy DeVos in 60 Minutes. <laughs> but um, I think that public schools are the basis of our democracy. I mean, they provide education to everyone and they need to be funded and they need to the, the federal government doesn't really put so much into funding for the schools that really comes from our local governments the school districts and from 
the state government. The state government is clearly not providing enough funding uh, for our schools. And, you know, you hear sometimes that, oh, it's not just about the money. But really, if you don't have enough money in your schools, it is about the money. And so I have been a strong proponent of equitable funding for education uh, since I've been in the house. And I happen to live in Lower Marion School District where people move so that they can send their kids to a really good school district and people pay the taxes that go along with that. And I think that in some ways, this is one of the things that's really important to us and we need to actually begin to have conversations about how do we pay for our government services? So if you look at education as a public good, how are we paying for it? And is it really important to us? And we need to find the will to be able to have honest, transparent conversations about how we pay for things, because nothing is free. Even the free lunch programs are not free. And so I think that it's time that we have conversations that really get to the root of what we want in this country. We have to look about, is education important? I think public education is the standard, uh, and it's what we should be striving for. Thank you. I would like to give a really short answer to this question because I'm really interested in some of the other um, questions also. So. In, in uh, just to be brief, healthcare is definitely a right. It's an absolute right. And I do favor Medicare for all. I think that clearly it's, it, as, as people have spoke before me, it's, it's a good system, it works, and uh, I think it makes sense. Great. It's, it's such an important question and um, and we don't really have very good answers at this point. So, I mean, I, I agree with sensible gun laws. There was somebody on the radio this afternoon talking, who was a gun owner, and talked about how it's hard to take some of these handguns away, but then they asked him about the assault weapons, and he said, I just don't see any sense or any real reason that any non-military person has to have any of those assault weapons. And I think we need to get to that point, but I think one of the problems we face is that those guns are out there, and I, I don't really know what we do about getting them. I mean, it, Madeline and I, like several years ago, talked about doing a gun buyback, remember, with the police department. Mm -hmm. And um, so, it, 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 this is, I think, one of the most challenging questions that we have um, these days. And I remember um, early on, uh, as I think a freshman House member, the NRA came out to Harrisburg and asked to meet with members of the House who were from the southeastern uh, part of the state. And we sat with them, and they wanted us to back on, off on these preemption laws. And we said, why would we do that? Because the people that we represent actually want those local municipalities to have these laws. I think that's the bill that uh, Shira was referring to earlier. And I know that some of my municipalities actually really fought the NRA, went to court, and were, did not prevail, unfortunately. Um, and others didn't have the money to spend. So I think, you know, the NRA is a shill for gun manufacturers. Right. And the money that they're putting out, I mean, I, I don't see any of that money. I wouldn't want any of that money, but, you know, it, I think we really have to put our heads together and because if the NRA members, I mean, I, I've talked to NRA members who live in my community. I went and talked to them because I said, look, you're the person I know who is a hunter. And he said, I haven't, he said, I still go hunting, but I haven't shot at a deer for years. He said, the, re the thing I like about hunting is being in the woods when it's quiet. And I've talked to other people who said they feel the same way. but. What we face in Harrisburg, I think, is only one small part of what we're facing across this country. And, and it's not a partisan issue for us in Harrisburg. So, but it is a discussion that is really very difficult. And I will tell you that a recent incident that happened in the House 
and the knowledge that House members have concealed carry licenses and that they're carrying weapons on the floor of the House. Wow. That is a frightening yeah. feeling because they truly believe that having a gun means that we're all safer. And I don't think the statistics, I think there was something recently, the New York Police Department, they have a very low percentage of actually um, being able to shoot and, and injure people. And it's like, and they are trained to do this work. So we, this is a huge problem and it's a real culture shift. I don't really have a great answer. It's just that I recognize, you know, what a gigantic problem it is because these are our kids, but they're they're adults. I mean, it's it's frightening. It's frightening. So I wish I had a better answer. So I started out tonight talking about how I've stepped up um, to include people, people who weren't didn't have a voice. And it's what I think of um, in trying to answer that question. It's a really good question. I have two nieces who are biracial. And there were, you know, I look at them now and I think, wow, you know, they're potentially going to be facing something that I've never had to face, my daughter never had to face, in, in just in, in prejudice. And it becomes very personal. But I think that it, 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 we have to educate. It goes to education because education is a leveler. But it's also an opportunity to open your mind to other people, to other ways that people do things, to other cultures, to other religions, to other gender choices. I mean, to everything. But the, the racial piece, I mean, remember when Barack Obama was elected? and how we thought that this was a new time for America. And I remember we went down to his first inauguration, and it was just such an incredible feeling to be there in Washington with, I think, two million people, with so many children who had been given an opportunity to look at this man and think that I could be president. I mean, this is one of the reasons we do these things. And in some ways, it's like with the election of Donald Trump, it's been, it's been erased in so many ways. And it's just, I mean, just the hatred that comes out. I, I have to constantly remind myself that I have a sign in my front yard that says, hate has no home here. And when I'm really, pissed off at Donald Trump, I have to go out and I have to look at that sign and say, you have a sign in your yard that hate has no home here. And, and so I just feel like, you know, this, it's an important sign. The sign is still there. It was still there when I left the house tonight. But I think that we have to open our arms. We have to be the United States of America. We have to really be the country that we were born to be that we have worked so hard at, so many of us. And whether it's racial inclusion, I mean, these things are so important because we can't be ourselves when we're excluding other people. We can't be ourselves when other kids aren't getting the opportunities that our kids are getting. And so, I like the idea of another Civil Rights Act. Uh, I remember the Civil Rights Act. I remember going to churches in, Germantown and, and listening and singing We Shall Overcome and I remember I remember all of these things and it, it so I, I think we really need to have discussions but I think we have to get rid of the hate and we have to really just open our hearts to people who don't have as much as we do and maybe even people who have more than we have in some ways which is difficult but I think this is one of the central issues because I still go back to when Obama was president and the hope that we felt that we were entering a new era, and it's like, boy, it's only eight years later. All right. Thank you. Well, I want to get to the audience. So I did talk about Emerge, and I did talk about empowering women. 
the women also have to be willing to step up and take the chance to run for office, to go after that, you know, that new job that you think, oh, who's going to get that? You're going to get it because you are probably just as well prepared for any of those jobs. And I think that this is what we have to think about as women. It's up to us because guess what? The guys are not going to just say, oh, oh, we need a woman here. We have to say this. We have to put ourselves in the places where we're making it uncomfortable for people. Oh my gosh, we have three great women. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> Who am I going to vote for? Well, guess what? We all got into this election, and we know that in an election, somebody's going to win, and other people are going to lose. We're all willing to take that risk, because being a congresswoman is actually a really big deal, especially in Pennsylvania, because we don't have any. So I think that as a woman, we have to be willing to stand up there and say, oh, I think I can do this. In fact, I don't just think I'm gonna, I can do it, I am going to do it and step forward. And then, guess what? We also need to, to support each other, write checks, do all of that good stuff because how, the men are not gonna say, oh, Equal Rights Amendment, you know, because they don't all think maybe progressively. Like, I, Joe does think progressively. But guess what? Uh -oh. He doesn't know the same things we know. <laughs> so that's my answer. Great. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Everybody, this is a this is a personal question for me. Last Saturday on the 17th of March, we just celebrated my daughter's 20th year together with her partner and her wife now. They got married last Mother's Day weekend. And I will tell you that we had a party on March 17th. They decided they didn't want to do it uh, last May, that they wanted to wait and celebrate this 20th anniversary. And when I look at them and think they've been together for 20 years, and it was the best party. It was just wonderful. So, and, and it took them a while to make the decision to get married. When, when, when things changed at the federal government level, it was, you know, I just looked at my daughter and said, so when are you going to get married? And it took them, it did take them a while. So, it, for me, it's, this is why it's important, because it's my daughter, and it's other people that I know, but it's a personal kind of thing, and it goes to that whole idea of inclusion, that we have to support people, because it really is, love is love, and it's as simple as that.